and what it was that originally inspired you to explore this period of history? Um, a lifelong interest in the home front um, uh, from a book I read when I was 11 called um, How We Lived Then. Um, experience of being behind the scenes in television about the extraordinary rivalries and the egos that went on and a wish to combine the two to talk about that essentially trivial business of film and filmmaking set in an era when the world was deeply serious about trying to make entertainment in a serious time. Uh, Catherine is a very young uh, woman who is talented but is very um, is not aware of her talent really and she in an era when uh, in virtually every job men were, men were constantly called up and going off to war women suddenly found themselves doing things that they would never have done before and C Catherine's promotion in it from uh, secretary in an advertising agency to copywriter to film writer what would not have been wildly abnormal this happened during the war there was sensational promotions and extraordinary um, changes in people's lives and Catherine represents somebody a young woman who who realizes she can do far more than she thought I mean things have changed a great deal even from when I started in the media and radio but but nevertheless it is still a, a minority sport for women to, to, to write um, to, to, be, to be screenwriters, to write comedy. But things have changed a great deal, but I hope this reminds us, reminds us of our roots. How did the actual experience of making a film well, compare to, to that stereotype? All those, all those vicious rivalries, you know, it was just the same. No, it wasn't. It was the lovely, it was lovely. And although it took a long time, my God, it took a long time. I mean, I compressed that in, in the book. Um, and the, the film takes about a year from start to finish. This took, I don't know, I think it was six years ago it was option, maybe seven. It took a long time, but then films do. Um, and it was relatively smooth in the end, and the people were lovely, and the acting was good, and the writing was terrific, so I, I, couldn't, I couldn't be more happy about it. We, we talked a lot, and I'm very fond of Gabby. I mean, I, I uh, dedicated my next book to her, so I think she's fantastic. We did talk, um, but what I really felt is that she really, she not only read the book and knew it better than I did by the end, but she researched the era thoroughly, and she, she turned what was basically um, a, a, a long sweep of narrative into, into a drama, something that I could never have done. She, she, she made it filmic and, and, and did it quite brilliantly, I think. Um, because it's a big book with a lot of plot and like all, all novels it had to be narrowed down for a film and she did it absolutely beautifully and with great skill. And also when she wrote jokes they were, I think they were as funny as my jokes so I'm really pleased about that. What were the challenges and rewards of adapting this book into the exquisite screenplay we now see on our screens? Thank you for that. Um, the challenges are, were that the book is incredibly rich and in kind of re-engineering it for the screen you know, lots was going to have to go, so some of my favourite bits in the book didn't make it into the screenplay. But the rewards were, you know, I spent, it's a long time you spend working with a character, with the characters and with the book, and that was a few years off and on spent working with characters that I never stopped finding exciting and uh, that I never stopped laughing at and never stopped loving, really. You thought I fell in love with them all. Everyone falls in love, particularly with Gemma's uh, character, our lead. Can you talk a little bit about what, for you, uh, her character really represents and how much you fell in love with her? I, the thing I loved always about Catherine was that she's not a trailblazer. She's somebody, well, she ends up being a trailblazer, but she's somebody who um, doesn't expect very much of herself at the beginning of the film. She um, thinks that what, that what she does best, really, is inspire her artist uh, husband and by the end of the film she's realized that actually she would rather make her own work than inspire someone else and it's quite a, it's a very kind of compelling but quite quiet journey and um, and I think Gemma does that so beautifully she's got a real core of strength without being um, while lacking in the character lacks confidence a bit and Gemma's got that so beautifully at the beginning the combination of quiet inner strength but a slight lack of self-confidence and then she grows in confidence and kind of open blossoms and it's lovely to watch. Rachel Sterling's character Phyllis as well, another uh, fantastic addition and not really as present in the original book. Can you talk about the decision to expand her as a force in the film? Well, there's another character in the book who didn't make it at all into the screenplay called Edith and Edith is a, was a just gorgeous character and some of Edith became attached to Phil and some of and so that character became richer and and bigger I think because of that so she's sort of she's carrying shades of another character with her 
and and we just all we love we all found that character very stimulating and very very funny and really wanted to see more of her and certainly with Rachel playing it. What do you think it is about that particular period of our history which still feels so relevant and captures our imagination so much? It's so interesting that I think the I think I thought about that a lot, why people are so drawn to the Second World War. And I remember being on buses in London years ago that, that were breaking down in the snow and people were helping each other and old people were saying, oh, it's like being in the war again. And I think there was something about collective experience. You know, it's a very, we're all very much broken down into individuals now. And I think there was something, even though it was a terrible experience for so many people, even in this country, which wasn't occupied and, you know, that there was something about the fact that people were in it together, that your pay, you weren't isolated in your experience. And I think people have a yen for that, to feel part of a community, to feel part of something. I think they did. Phil, Phyllis, is a hard-nut wordsmith who works for Ministry of Information. Um, and you don't quite know what she does. You think she's a spy of some kind. But actually, she ends up slightly kind of taking Catherine, Gemma's character, under her wing and being the only other woman who works in that industry, nurturing her and looking after her, and probably falling in love with her, but that might be my own private backstory. <laughs> I mean, this is a beautiful film with a lot of different themes and levels that it's working on. For you, what was it that most instantly resonated with you when you read the script for the first time? I think the resilience. I think the resilience that this film shows is something that we're all going to have to exercise in ourselves in the next coming years in the few next coming years. Um, and I think uh, there's a kind of parallel between what was going on at that period and what we're about to go through <laughs> Brexit-wise. Um, but also mostly it was Lona, to work with Lona Scherfig. Her all-seeing eye, her eye is like a kaleidoscope. You can't get away with anything. And she sees texture and depth and colour in things that appear just black and white on a page. So that was really the most biggest draw for me. Ordinarily, working from a book, it would make it easier, but Phyllis hardly appears in the book. Her character got engorged because she was so naughty and wonderful and um, wicked in her sense of humour that actually Gabby Chiappi made her more and more present in the film. She's kind of not really that present in the book. So I read the book thinking, oh, I'll get all my source material from this. And I was like, oh, Phyllis is hardly in it. So actually, we could go with, I could go with my own imagination um, in terms of developing the character and, and work with Lona on that. Uh, but source material, not that rich. Lisa, Lisa Evans, who wrote the book, said, oh, God, I wish I'd made Phyllis's part bigger now after she'd seen the film, so that's a compliment. <laughs> I wanted to bring to her a lack of uh, saccharine, a lack of kind of overly sugaring her character. She's not instantly likeable. I wanted her um, to be fierce and I wanted her to be uh, believably resilient um, because she exists in a man's world. This isn't a feminist film per se, but she is a strong woman, the only one in that particular world before Catherine arrives. Um, and I think my own personal story, I was just saying in... Uh, my own personal story, she slightly falls a little bit in love with Gemma's character. But then so does everybody, so that's okay. <laughs> the weather's absolutely perfect, uh, which, considering it's the middle of October, is astonishing. And it's such a love letter to, to British filmmaking because it's set around the, making the Second World War propaganda films from the Ministry of Information. So it's got a very dry, you know, fantastic, ironic British sensibility and also with this great love story in the middle of it. And Bill Nye is hands down brilliant. I hope he wins everything for his performance. Lorna's obviously a unique director. What do you think is so special about her vision as a filmmaker? Um, well, I loved her work on an education. Um, and she's standing right there next door. I think that maybe her Scandinavian sort of cool-eyed sensibility um, chimes very well with the, with the British way of looking at things that are British and so she brings a, an outsider's viewpoint to it which I, you know, they, they just meshed absolutely perfectly in the making of it and we had a great we had a genuinely good time making this film, it wasn't one of those things where you had to pretend that oh, we were all a happy family and everybody hated each other and it was miserable this was a fantastic experience so I hope the film is as good as we had the time of making it All the people that uh, I 
as a child growing up in Swaziland, uh, which was sort of time warp like England in the 1950s, there were a lot of people that had been through the colonial services or through the uh, First or Second World War that I grew up with. Um, and they were the kind of people that are actually characters in this film. So I felt weirdly as if I'd gone home meeting a lot of them and, and recreating all of this. Um, because I grew up without, there was no television where I grew up. So living in an age when people relied on propaganda films and black and white films was something that was the norm of my childhood. So I don't know, I'm the right time walked old fart to play in this. Thanks very much. What do you think it is about this particular period of history and a particularly British spirit at that time which still captures our imagination all these decades later? Films have never been more important than, than during the London Blitz and you're in a city where things where you're under such pressure and such, but you also want to live so much and you see that in these characters that they have a huge appetite for for the work, for the films they're making and for each other uh, and, and that just is a really good cocktail and very, very really good uh, platform to stand on when you start telling this story. Catherine in the film Gemma Artisan's part is is a young girl who's a secretary. She can type 60 words a minute, and she comes into the Ministry of Information. And little by little, because of the war, she gets to write real feature films, propaganda films, uh, dramatic films, and finds out how incredibly enjoyable that job can be. She falls in love, she gets to go to the shoot, she gets to meet a lot of the actors in the film, within the film, and you, with her, you open up this world that is uh, seductive and funny, but also has some very emotional moments to it. Both Sam Claflin and Bill Nye and, and some of them, Richard E. Grant, Jeremy Irons, Henry Goodman, they are quite fearless. I mean, they they read the script and they trust that the story is strong enough so they take chances and you can see that. You, they get to use their musicality and their funny bone and their um, willingness to sometimes be emotional and dramatic and, and so you get to see a lot of their range which is always fascinating that they, they, these are uh, the characters have so many facets and nuances and um, and they, yeah, it's been a really, really nice experience with those men and with uh, Gemma too. It's been Rachel Sterling and it's a great cast, it really is. What for you is the true power, the importance of filmmaking as a creative medium? I think you have responsibility. We, we, we know films work. They work then and we still know they work and that gives you no matter how small your access to the media is, it gives you a responsibility and you have to do something to live up to it. Not just in terms of which values are in your films, but also to make things that are truly entertaining and warm and fun and where you don't um, take the audience for granted and don't uh, take them for uh, someone who is, you know, less well-read or something than yourself is. That's not very well put. Like, there you go, the audience is smarter than I am. <laughs> London Film Festival is definitely the right place to, to show this film because it is about a chapter in London film history and it's also very, very festive to, that the film is celebrated this way and that the mayor is going to be here and I'm really pl proud and, and as soon as I'm over my nerves I'll enjoy every second of it. <laughs> Well, my character is not so much wonderful as chronically self-absorbed, pompous, and in his declining years. And they thought of me, which is slightly worrying. Uh, I play Ambrose Hilliard, who is a, a sort of uh, arrogant Wally. So I don't know why they came to me, but uh, but uh, and I d and who did I draw upon? Nobody really. I suppose I have met Wallies over the years. Actors have a reputation for being, you know, sexually incontinent, probably not very clever and uh, chronically self-absorbed. Um, and I think they're about as much of all those things as the average airline pilot, veterinarian, or you know, biochemist. But we got, we got the rap for that. So, and I'm, normally I resist those kind of things, but this is so beautifully written. And there are people like that in every job, you know. And he's a very, you know, a very attractive part to play. Not, not a wonderful person, but a good part.
Uh, the idea that you might be amusing. I mean, I don't, you know, I mean, it's, you know, it's, uh, it's, and also that I get to play two different people, as it were, not two different people, but I get to play an actor and then an actor playing a part. So, uh, and the fact, is, you know, and I've got some good lines. Gemma was terrific and exemplary. Uh, she's wonderful to do business with, and I really appreciated working with her. She's very, very, you know, she, everybody knows she's incredibly smart and incredibly enchanting. So uh, we had a, and she's easy and dreamy and a Democrat and lovely. So we had a laugh. Lona Scherfig, I, you know, I've, I've wanted to work with her for a long time, and that's one of the reasons I did the film. We, we tried before and it didn't come off and this time it did. She was dreamy to work with. She's incredibly smart. She gives you big gifts every day, big fat jokes. Try this, see if it's funny. I mean, she handed me things on a plate. Not everybody does that. And she also laughed at my jokes, which is my idea of a director. There's been a lot of talk about the 1940s being the golden age of film, implying that today is no longer that. Do you agree? What are your thoughts? No, I think it's. I think when it, people start generalising in that way, you know you're in trouble. Uh, I think there were good films then and bad films then, just like there are good films now and bad films now. Uh, I do think that that period is a very rich period for to, to to make films about because it's such a savage period in London's history. And I'm interested in London. I live in London, and I love London. And uh, Stephen Woolley and Amanda Posey, who are standing next to me, I mean, they've made several films about London. And this and the fact that we get the Lord Mayor's gala at the, London, the Lord Mayor of London's gala is kind of perfect, you know. Are there any other directors that you particularly like to work with in the future? Uh, okay, I'd like to work with, please if I can, can I please work with Paul Thomas Anderson and Steven Spielberg and uh, can Alan Parker come back and make a film all about me and can I work with David Hare and will Richard Curtis come out of directoring retirement and make another film and who else? And can I make a film with, can I make another film with Lona Scherfig and can I make another film with Isabel Quaget, who I've just made a film with? So you don't want much? I don't want much. <laughs> Come on. Uh, the next thing that comes out is a film called The Limehouse Golem. It's based on Peter Aykroyd's book, uh, Dan Lino and the Limehouse Golem. It's 1880. There's a lot of fog. There's a lot of blood. It's a serial killer movie. Myself and Danny Mays, the great young English actor, uh, we wander London looking for clues. I am, and I always get a bang out of saying this, I am Detective Inspector John Kildare of Scotland Yard. And I never say that without feeling good about myself. And uh, Danny Mays plays George Flood. He's my constable. But he's more than just a constable. But I can't tell you anything about that right now. But uh, yeah, it's, it's great. And it's directed by Juan Carlos Medina and produced by Stephen Woolley. And uh, Olivia Cook with an E the wonderful young actress from Oldham. She is our leading lady, and Douglas Booth is in it, and many, many other people that you will know and recognize and admire. I, I, I mean, it's always a relevant story. I, I feel like the stories are told because they're relevant, and every story is relevant in, in its own certain way. This one sort of deals with, with kind of a, a nation coming together uh, when it, it needs to, um, and it was during the, obviously the Second World War. The, the film is, but uh, you know now, like with everything that's going on in our world, I think it is a time, an opportunity, a chance. Hopefully, an inspire inspiration it inspires a nation to come together and, and sort of make a change. Uh, there are there are certain aspects of this film, like including the women's the women's sort of or the diversity issue, which. It shouldn't even be an issue in today's society, but still is, and I think it addresses that in such a light way and a very. It doesn't ram the message down anyone's throat, but it, it does. It does uh, approach that, and I think um, that's that's always a positive. So hopefully, it will get people talking and asking the right questions and fighting the fight. You know. What were the pros and cons of having that moustache you have in the film? Um, the pros were I loved it, and I could actually grow it myself. So I was really quite proud of myself. I was like, this is my first opportunity to be, to be a man. Um, <laughs> and, and the negative things were I, got, I, I grew really attached to it and my wife didn't. Uh, it tickled her upper lip. So that was a little disappointing. Um, but no, no, it's, it's, I don't know, it was, it was, it was, it was a, a departure from anything I've done before. And I'm not afraid of looking different or, you know, each role should be looking different to the ones before. Does it signal maybe more serious roles to come in the future? Uh, yeah, I hope so. 
More than anything else, I just wanted to work with Lona again. Um, she, she was the one who first approached me with this project, and I think once I read the script and I saw the unique way that it was sort of dealt with war and, and you know, an insight into filmmaking of this time, uh, which was obviously a very poignant moment in history of, of filmmaking, um, it was a, a sort of a no-brainer, really, an opportunity to be more mature for myself. So. Thank you.